Hey, this is Jade. Just want a quick message before the episode. I uh, just wanted to give a big thanks to our two main sponsors, uh, Play Music uh, and uh, JQ Clothing, uh, Gene Queen. Uh, they are both huge supporters of the scene, uh, as well as us, bands. Um, they just support uh, events and everything that's going on in Vancouver. Two really great companies, great stores. Um, if you go, I'll put links down below. They're in our links of sponsors. So go check them out and give them some love. Um, thanks again for everyone, and we'll get right back to the video. Hey guys, this is Jade from uh, The Scene, uh, here with a very unusual uh, episode. This will be up on the YouTube channel, as well as I may drop the audio in our podcast as well. I'm joined by some amazing musicians um, from kind of like all over the world. Uh, some are Vancouver-based. Uh, Harry's all the way from amazing Mexico. Uh, I can't remember exactly what city, but um, yeah, so... Um, I'm here to talk about uh, the Musicians Coalition. Um, tell me a little bit, uh, Steve, why don't you introduce it and tell us a little bit about the goal of it. Hi, right. so uh, my name's Steve Sanis. I've uh, just uh, currently, uh, in the last week or so, um, finished up about two years of work uh, putting together a proposal to provide a Canadian Musician Support Fund um, for musicians and uh, artists right across Canada. Um, originally started because uh, streaming uh, royalties are exploitive. And I went to my MP, Ron McKinnon, to try and uh, persuade our government to push a little harder to get those royalty rates up uh, and to also uh, compensate musicians with uh, income tax exemptions to make up for the current exploitation. His answer was, that's a great idea. How are we going to pay for it? So I started working on that. I didn't have an answer for him at the time. So uh, in the last week or so, um, I finished up that proposal, and I contacted some friends, and I had been bouncing this around with my bandmate and good friend, longtime friend Ted Tossoff, who also plays with Blue Voodoo, and um, uh, he, you know, kind of crafted it from, from, from working with him. Uh, uh, last week, I decided I need to reach out to some people who were masters at... Uh, uniting our music scene. So I reached out to uh, my music uh, 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 make a scene uh, founders, uh, Sherelle Jardine and Mark Gladstone. Mark also plays keyboards for Prism, and they also have a band called Head and Stone Poets. So um, Sherelle and Mark were thrilled to get on board, and we had a little meeting, just like we're meeting right now online, and we formed the Canadian Musicians Coalition. Um, and we got a website up, a uh, pretty crude website, grassroots website. Right now, my good friend Robert Campbell's in Nova Scotia working on the new website, and Ken Boyer just uh, provided us some awesome new graphics for our banner, and uh, we reached out with a petition on Wednesday, and currently we have almost uh, 2,000, um, almost 2,000, uh, uh, um, well, sorry, we have, we have almost 1,100 signatures on our uh, petition and over 1500 uh, members on our on our facebook group and it's climbing by the minute uh, we just watched the ticker keep going up and up and up and lots of conversation uh about it uh people want to find out what it's all about the proposal is posted on the website www.canadianmusiciancoalition.ca uh, uh, and uh, there's lots of hyperlinks and stuff to back up with uh, resources and references. So if someone takes the time to read the three page proposal, it pretty much tells you everything you need to know about it and why all musicians and all music venue owners uh, and anyone that promotes music uh, should be getting on board with this and all creatives as well. So um, hopefully it's gonna be a game changer, but we've got a long battle ahead of us and we need everybody to sign this petition, please. Yeah, because the the first thing that comes to mind, um, like I love the idea. I think it's great, and I I I fully support you know musicians being paid for what they do. And I agree that Spotify is like the whole streaming. It's not. It's so unequally balanced. I mean, the amount of pay you get per uh, per stream, and that's not even a flat rate across the board. It's it's dependent on so many different variables and things like that. And then the algorithm, you know, whether or not your music gets promoted and showcased on the actual streaming app and site itself, like 
it's a pain. Um, but like, um, you're, you're, you're kind of, um, you, you went, uh, to, you, you know, to your, your MP and you were talking about, um, trying to get them, the, the, the government to push, uh, cause they would essentially be having to push the like Spotify. They would have to push the streaming service to give a greater share of the revenue, uh, to the artists. Um, that's, that's like, it seems like an immense challenge just because you're trying to work with the government to change a private company essentially and their way of thinking and doing things. Exactly. And that's why it doesn't work. And um, our government and our, our PRO, SOCAN and, and Music Canada and, and all our representatives our music associations across Canada, Music BC and all the associations provincially have all been working hard to try um, Songwriters Association of Canada. Uh, all of them have been trying really, really hard to get the, uh, the, the streaming companies to actually um, be fair. And uh, so Ron McKinnon, uh, Minister Ron McKinnon, asked me to go to uh, the Copyright Reform Committee um, that was working hard to do that on behalf of Canada. And the United States, it was the American Musicians Federation trying to do it. And in 2018, they were actually successful. They actually got a, a one court case that uh, awarded them a 44% increase on streaming royalties. Um, and, uh, and everybody was celebrating. And I thought to myself, well, not much to celebrate about. Yeah, it's a step forward, but 44% of half a cent is only 72% of a cent. <laughs> and you can't feed your family on that. You can't, you can't buy your instruments. You can't put your tour together. You can't record another record really. Mm -hmm. And what happened? Uh, Spotify and Amazon turned around and slapped us all in the face and took us back to court, uh, to appeals court, because they didn't think it was fair. And, so, they, and they have the budget to do that. That's the hard thing about battling a big corporation like this, is you're not just battling, you know, it's, it's like fighting a bank, something that has endless amounts of money. Impossible, Gene. It's it. absolutely impossible. And, and, and to me, that was sort of the, the thing that tore it for me, uh, that let me uh, led me to believe that this is a futile battle. It will never, ever, ever happen. And I had lots of these conversations last night on our Facebook wall, lots of creatives coming on, on and saying, hey, you know, it's not fair that you're going to tax the music com consumers. Uh, musicians need to just write better songs and, and, and promote themselves <laughs> better so they can make more money, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm kind of scratching my head. And with respect to those guys, I understand where they're coming from. They... They see themselves as professional writers, as am I. I've got five albums out there, and I've seen squat from them. I've gotten airplay. I've gotten great reviews. Um, I've been nominated, you know, uh, for Western Canadian Music Award. Um, none of that stuff matters because the streaming royalties are so low, and there's so much content out there now. Millions, literally millions of titles for people to choose from in an unlimited format. And there's no money coming back to the musicians. It's gutted our physical sales, which is how we used to fund our recording projects. Right. I used to be able to put out a record and recoup my, my cost on that record within a year or so, and then start making some money on that and start getting ready to do my next record. Can't do that anymore. My last record I put out in 2017, I lost money. It was the first record I've ever lost money on. Well, and, of course, everyone just expects it for, to be able to go, oh, is it on Spotify? And then they can go listen exactly. to it for free. I even boycotted putting it out on digital streaming for three months just to see what would happen. And, yeah, I sold records to friends and family and, you know, fans and stuff, but not enough copies to make back my investment. And uh, after three months, I had no choice but to put it out on Spotify and, and all the other streaming companies. Uh, all the other streaming corporations. I hit the checkbox on my CD Baby account and it went out to all the digital distributors. And um, I started seeing the, 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 the listening happening, the streaming happening, but very little money coming back. And I thought to myself, this is ridiculous. We need a different kind of, of system. So I remembered that in 1999, uh, SOCAN and our uh, MIAs pushed really hard to get a levy on blank discs. Because if you remember, we had the whole piracy thing happening with discs. Yeah. And so they put a 29 cent levy per disc on CDs. So when you go and buy a pancake of 50 CDs, it would cost you an extra 
$14.99 to buy that $99, uh, $9.99 uh, pa pancake of discs. And still, that kind of comes to this day. I still buy blank discs and I still get You have to go pay, right? And that money was being equally distributed amongst the highest um, um, uh, uh, radio royalties and, and, and later streaming royalties. Uh, but the problem with that system is, is that the only people who make money are the people who are already making money. The average musician, like myself and you guys, don't see any of that because we just don't make enough uh, uh, radio play and we don't get enough streams to actually register on that, on that scale. So it's sort of a rich get richer and the poor get poorer because every time I went and bought a pancake of CDs to demo my masters or my mixes, I was paying into the fund, <laughs> which I thought that was crazy because I, I, as a SOCAN member, I should be exempt from that, right? But that's not the way it worked. So to sort of bring it to a point, uh, my, my plan was everybody in Canada who has an internet connection or a data plan has access to streaming. Everybody listens to stream music, whether you have Spotify or whether you're just listening for free on YouTube or, or, or any of the other, Vivo or whatever, whatever your platform is, you're listening to stream music, you're listening to content, and most people aren't paying for it. Mm -hmm. You're paying for your internet connection, you're paying for your data connection, but you're not paying anything extra for your music. And if you do have a Spotify account, which incidentally I boy boycotted, I don't give them any of my money. Um, if you do have a Spotify account or, or Pandora or Deezer or whatever else, you know, Apple Music, um, you're still getting unlimited music for only $9.99 or $14.99. And that $14.99 gets you six personal devices in your household. Yeah. Well, how are we going to make any money from that, especially when uh, the streaming corporations are keeping the, the vast majority of that money? Um, Spotify in 2018 or 2019, it's in the proposal, yeah, yeah. wrote $7.44 billion, right? Yeah. The average musician makes $100 in streaming royalties a year. That's the inequity of it, right? Yeah. So now that we're, so, so what happened, it's shifted from artists trying to make their living from, um, from record sales to touring. So now we're touring and selling T-shirts because they can't download a T-shirt yet, right? So, so you're, you're, you're doing your tours. Uh, and now with the pandemic, we've lost that revenue stream. So now I read today that the Canadian Music um, uh, Live, uh, the Can Canadian Live Music Association, uh, Erin uh, Benjamin is the president of that. She's also with Live Nation. Uh, they've been in the paper quite a bit. They've been in the news quite a bit lately trying to get support from the government. Problem is, is that most of the associations across the, the, the country who are trying to advocate for musicians and working really hard for us are going to the government, just like I did two years ago with our hand held out saying, we need some funding. Mm. And now every business, every business in, in the world right now is going to their governments and asking for financial support. McKinnon challenged me two years ago, how are we gonna pay for this? And I thought, well, the, the money has to come from the music consumers. Because before the digital age, I used to buy my records. 10 songs would cost me 10 bucks, or 10 songs in the vinyl years or the CD years would cost me 20 bucks, yeah. right? So if I was to go and buy my music, I was spending a couple of hundred to 500 to $1,000 a year on buying content for my collection, right? I, right beside me, I've got a, a tower of over 300 CDs looking at me, right? At 20 bucks a piece, do the math. That's a lot of money going into the, and I have a graph on the proposal. If you, there's the, 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 the documents full of hyperlinks and you can click on those hyperlinks and it gives you all the information that you need to back up what I'm talking about. We, consumers used to buy the music, even in the digital age, they used to download the 99 cent MP3, and I would, you know, depending on what you, CD Baby would pay me 90 cents on that 99 cents, iTunes would pay me 67 cents on that 99 cents. Considerably more than the half cent I get every time, actually 0 .4, 0 0.0047 of a cent. And on YouTube, you're only getting 28%, 27% of a cent every time someone listens. 1,500 streams on YouTube to make a buck. Yeah. Right? Who's going who's gonna to live on that? So, but the consumers are using the product and they're not paying for it fairly. 
right? And most of them don't know that they're not paying for it fairly. It's just the way our music's been devalued. So I thought, if we put a levy on every internet connection, every internet subscription, and every data plan, mobile data plan, and everybody paid an extra four bucks a month for their access to internet, whether it's data or it's internet, right, home internet, there are 30 million, 31 million, uh, 31 million Canadians uh, who have a smartphone. 14.1 uh, million Canadians have a household internet connection. That amounts to about 43 million internet connections based on uh, the CITR's stats on telecommunication. If you multiply that by $4 a month, it comes out to just over $2 billion that but the government would connect, collect on our behalf. And that money then would go back to the musicians in the form of an income tax top-up. So if you're living under the $30,000 living wage as a musician, and you submit your income taxes at the end of the year, and you fall under that, you would get a subsidy to bring you up to a living wage of $30,000 a year. In addition, so uh, the, uh, um, Canadian, uh, the uh, Canadian Council of the Arts says that there's uh, 35,000 registered music professional musicians across Canada. If you multiply that uh, amount, $30,000 by 35,000 musicians, that's approximately a billion dollars. Now we still have a billion dollars that we can give back to music venues to incentivize them to have perform to, to have um, uh, performance uh, performance incentives so that they can um, so that so that they can uh, be more motivated to have live performances that pay musicians a fair wage right not jams not open mics but actual professional musicians performing and getting paid a standard rate for the performance. So it would now create work for our music, our music community as well. So now we're not just holding our hand out, we're now creating, rebuilding our music economy with this money, right? And we are putting our musicians to work. It would also have enough money to, to put more funding into creative funding for Creative BC or Creative Across Canada, Factor Grants, Canada Council Grants, etc. And there would still be money to fund music education. I, I sit on the advisory uh, uh, committee for music counts right now for education. And uh, right now, music counts gets the majority of their money from donations from usually uh, high profile musicians and the general public who feel they want to support public music education. With our economy crashing now, I imagine, I don't know for a fact, but I imagine that they're going to have a tougher time getting those donations. And this uh, Canadian Music Support Fund would also provide funds for organized music accounts to provide uh, a music education funding so that our young musicians can be developed properly so that we have a healthy next generation of musicians. So that's basically it in a nutshell. The last thing, because the, the ones who are making money are going, well, what about us? We're the ones who are the high flyers in the, in, in the music community. Why don't we get anything? So in Ireland, all artists, all artisans, whether they're musicians or painters or sculptors or whatever, they live tax-free on their music income. They don't pay any taxes on any income that they make on their music. So I've also included that in the proposal, that can, all, all Canadian artisans, whether they're DJs or they're, or they're musicians or they're painters or authors or whatever, you don't pay tax on anything you make to make up for the exploitation of digital piracy and uh, underpayment. And that's it. That's the, that's the proposal in, in a nutshell. Now, I, I, I love it in, in theory, but um, it just raises a couple points in my mind, uh, just in the way of, like, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Sure. Um, you know, there's some times where, like, you know, you're, I've, I've seen on Facebook where people are like, oh, man, if I have, you know, 2,000 friends on Facebook, if everyone sent me a dollar, I'd have an extra $2,000 and it's true. If everyone paid an extra $4 on an internet connection, we'd have a ton of extra money, but I mean, it's, you know, you're, you're counting on those numbers. Um, you know, how, how many are you, is those numbers like, because for me, like I have my phone plan. I also have a phone plan for my son. Am I going to have to pay an extra $8 
for to make up for his or am I if you if he doesn't even stream music or if he watches YouTube like is there where where does you know where where kind of does it and <laughs> yeah because like no. you know and and then also a lot of people have a hard time paying their internet bills as it is already sure they do. Um, why would you, why why you know for them why would they want to pay more to get a service that they're already paying for if they're already paying for spotify they're having to pay an extra four dollars which i know isn't a lot um in the long run but you know, every month it, you know, it adds up and just as an, it's like another streaming service. You're, mm -hmm. you're asking people to pay more money on top of paying money, um, which is taxation, which is how the world works and things like that. But like trying to get that to the general populace because musicians will, you know, and then all, on that, will musicians have to pay that too? Well, do we have to pay into that to get that? receiving in back or as you said you know some with the tax-free thing like where 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 does this all sit i can answer that for you so let, let, let's take them one at a time you asked me a bunch of questions there but they're all great questions so thanks for asking this because i do want to clarify that so first of all um the reason that the consumer needs to pay this four dollars is because they're paying way 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 under for a service that they're really not paying for yeah, they're paying nineteen. They're paying nine ninety nine minimum. A lot of people don't pay for Spotify. There's lots of unpaid subscriptions, right? They're just putting up with the commercials, right? Uh, and some are paying the premium for fourteen ninety nine, but that's still way undervalued for what they're getting in terms of content. The musicians are not getting paid, right? And it doesn't matter that you know. Yes, technically Spotify should be paying the musicians more. But even with that, we still wouldn't be making what we've lost in physical sales, right? Now, why does the consumer need to pay this? Well, one, it's the right thing to do because they're not, they're not really paying fair value for the music. Let's face it, um, $4 is a, cup of, it's a fancy cup of coffee. $4 is four $1 MP3s that you would have downloaded in, in, in the old days, right? Uh, just to put it in perspective. Most people don't have a problem going and spending $4 a day on a, cu a cup of coffee. In fact, some people will have more than a cup, one cup of coffee, right? Or whatever their, their vice happens to be. Um, we need to re, um, I hate the word, use the word re-educate, but really that's what needs to happen. What's happened is our culture has devalued music to such a degree because it's so readily available that music really doesn't have any value. I, today I wrote, music has less value than a stick of bubble gum, right? But when you think about the cost that goes into making music, these guys here all know, right? Yes, you do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the value of music, right, begins with buying your first instrument when you were a kid, investing into your music lessons, tens of thousands of all hours of rehearsals, and then you get good enough that you go out and you form a band and you start buying more music, and then you're spending tens of thousands of dollars on equipment and more rehearsal time, and then you realize you need to produce your own records, so now you've got your DAW at home, you know, your digital audio workstation, and you're putting more and more money and more hours and more hours. And then, you know, the old joke is, what do you call a person who loads $5,000 of, of equipment into a $500 car for a $50 gig? You know, a, music, a job, you know, to make 50 bucks, a musician. That's an unsustainable economy. So why does the music consumer need to pay in? Because it's unsustainable. If people love music as much as they do, and not only do they love it, it's an essential service to our society. Ask someone to live without music for even one day, especially now during a crisis, right? Music is, you know, a, a remedy for mental health. It's our social well-being. Music is an essential service. And the irony is, is that it's one of the most consumed services in our society, and people pay the least amount for it. And the people who create it are not being paid an adequate amount of money so that they can actually continue to create the music that is so essential to our society. But, I mean, you can make the same argument, though, 
with paying for our doctors, with paying for our teachers. Our teachers are horribly underpaid uh, and stressed with class sizes and things like that. Couldn't we essentially do the same thing but increase, you know, teacher salaries or... Well, we just did. Services. We just did. And here's, here's the thing, Jade. We just did. I belong to a union. I belong to a union called the British Columbia Federation of Teachers. And because I belong to a union, we're able to do a number of things as a collective, right? We have, we have strength in numbers. There are over 40,000 teachers in this collective in British Columbia. And we just successfully negotiated a collective agreement that didn't give us the raise that we wanted, but it was enough of a raise given the circumstances that we're in a crisis, right? Because we obviously had to back off on our demands because how can we ask for, for, you know, when everybody is crashing, right? So we, 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 we went to the table and we ended up, you know, negotiating a deal that everybody felt was fair. It wasn't what we wanted initially, but we got something. And teachers are making a living wage, we're making more than a living wage as teachers, and, and we have benefits and so on. This is what, the collect, this is what the, our coalition is. Now, it's not a collective, as someone cor corrected me, because in order to be a collective, we have to have membership dues and, yeah. and voting rights and so on, right? But as a coalition, we are stronger together in numbers, right? And what is different about what our coalition is trying to do right now is uh, than, than the rest of the, and I got to be fair, I don't know every detail of what every other association across Canada is trying to do, but I haven't read anyone in all the things that I've read. I haven't heard anybody say that we're going to the government with a solution of how we can fund our own recovery, right? And this solution that I've come up with, right, that I've uh, sharpened with my, my good friends, Mark, Sherell, Ted, Rob Montgomery, um, uh, we, the four of us have, have really kicked this around a lot. And um, we've come up, we think, with a plan. And I've been working on this proposal for two years now on my own, trying to figure out the nuts and bolts of it, right? And we've come up with a plan that we think is fair for consumers to pay $4 a month on top of their Spotify account. Or don't, don't buy Spotify. Listen to the commercials. Watch it on YouTube. Whatever. But, but you know, I think it's an affordable amount of money, right, to put in to sustain the musicians whom you love so much and whose music you love so much and need, right, so that we can continue to make music. And to be able to refund the venues that have now crashed, who are probably, many of them are not going to reopen their doors again. I've talked to the managers of many of the venues that I've been playing. Yeah, I well, lost my oh, whole calendar. Oh. We all, we've all done that, right? Yeah. We've all lost our calendars for the year. And I've gone to them and I've, I've asked them and they've said, look, you know, if this goes on for two more months, they said, we, we'll never reopen again. Now, the government did a pretty good job of coming back and, you know, with the, uh, the, the rent relief and with the $40,000 interest-free loan and a few other incentives to try and, or, or supports to try and keep their heads above water for a little longer. But the reality is, is that John Horgan, Premier John Horgan, just came out and said, you know, and, and, our, and our provincial health authority uh, or, uh, organization came out and said that until there's a vaccine. Well, yeah, yeah, happen. we all know that. We're done, right? So, so we're not coming back anytime soon. So mm -hmm. what's going to happen in between? We need... Oh, well, also, like, that also affects all the other non-musicians people in the music industry. You have like with this. One of my former students is is a uh, is a front of house engineer and uh, works on 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 concerts and 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 and, uh, and and so forth, movies and you know, all those people, grips, audio engineers, uh, studios, and a lot of them. Are musicians it goes well. on and on and on. They're all out of work. Yes, like so. I guess my question is. When if it if it gets passed and the four dollars gets sent, yeah, who does that directly affect? Who falls under a professional musician? Okay, so a professional musician, people, lots of people have been asking that, and I think in order to be a professional musician, you need to belong to an organization. You need to belong to uh, uh, one of either SoCan, right, which has a pretty extensive application. Uh, form it's free right it doesn't cost you anything but you do have to check some boxes in order to become a member for SoCan 
Um, so if you're a member of SOCAN, that means that you're a serious musician, a serious creative uh, uh, creator, right? So you're not just some hobbyist in a basement, uh, you know, throwing stuff out onto SoundCloud, right? You're, you're a professional. Um, uh, or belonging to one of the MIAs across Canada, whether Music PC or Music Sask or whatever, right? you got to belong to one of those, or to Keras, or to the Songwriters Association of Canada, uh, Music Canada. You need to belong to one of the professional associations in Canada to be considered a professional and to be uh, part of this benefit package. Uh, as far as the venues, well, that's easy. If, you're, if you own a business and you're going to put live music in your venue, then you'll be able to apply for a subsidy or a grant to subsidize the hiring of live acts in your venue, right? But and, what's stopping the guy who does play in this basement from just signing up to SOCAN and then being able to get a tax benefit at the end of the year? Well, what I'm hoping is, is that SOCAN and the MIAs will um, make their uh, application process more, a little stricter to have people reach a, a higher bar in order to become a professional. So for example, as a, as, a, as a teacher, in order for me to belong to the British Columbia Federation of Teachers, I have to hold a teaching certificate, right? I think that uh, we're gonna have to go back to the days of um, when uh, we had, the union was actually a required thing for you to perform in, uh, in the city or in the country or whatever. I think we need to go back to a system where we need to start vetting our, our, our musicians uh, to qualify for these, these, these grants. Now, part of it could be, can you earn, have you shown, uh, like one of the things that, that um, um, currently you need to do to be part of SOCAN is you need to show that you've created a work that's going to be released and get radio play, or uh, you have to be performing a ticketed concert, right? And I think at one time it was the ticket had to be a ten dollar amount in order for you to send that ticket stub and say yes, I'm a professional. I played a professional show. Here's here's my proof, right? So those kinds of measures uh, could be put in place to make sure that the people who are qualifying for this benefit are actually artists and showing a sincere effort to make a living from from music and creating music that is legitimate, right, as an artist. So that, I mean, we have some work to do in definitions. Uh, this is by no means, uh, this is a start, right? And I'm hoping what will happen is we'll get enough signatures to at least get the government to listen to us. So yesterday I sent a letter to uh, Minister McKinnon and CC'd it to uh, the Heritage Minister Stephen uh, Gibault out in, in, in Ottawa. Uh, and ask them to uh, bring this proposal to the floor as a private member's bill. So that's step one. But in order for that to happen, we need to show that there's massive public support for this uh, through this petition so that our coalition could go to the government and say, look, we have 30,000 signatures supporting this plan. Uh, as a democracy, you're now you know, uh, uh, bound to take a serious look at this and let's see if we can make this work. Now, having been in a union for a long time, I know the process, you know, you put, you put your idea out there and it goes through the round table and people make amendments to it. And, you know, people vote on amendments and it goes on and on and on until you end up with something that is a finished product that now can go to the floor uh, for, for, for it to be voted in as the bill. That's a long road. But given the urgency of the situation now, I'm hoping that it will be expedited to, to get it there more quickly, right? But it all starts with our grassroots movement right now with the Canadian Musicians Coalition. If people buy into this, and, and over the last three days, it's just been amazing. I mean, like we, this morning I woke up and we hit 1,000 signatures, and that was uh, just under um, the three days, just a little over two days, we hit 1,000 signatures, and it's been growing all day long. If we can get to 10,000 signatures by the end of the week, that, that'll make some, some noise and, and hopefully uh, we'll get people like CBC and, and, and some of the larger media outlets, you know, giving us some coverage and hopefully it'll spread like wildfire and we'll get those 30,000 signatures. I'm just pulling that out, out, out of the air right now because we have 35,000 musicians out there. Uh, I think even 10,000 signatures would probably get us the attention we need 
to at least be considered seriously. I can't imagine why a musician wouldn't sign up for this. Um, or a person who owns a music venue, or a creative who wants more funding in their creative grants, uh, or even uh, music teachers who want to see more funding come to their classrooms. This is a win-win for everybody. Oh, musicians will sign up for this. But there's people out there who are like, I demand the right to a haircut. And I feel like a lot of people are jerks and they'll be like, $4 a month. That's my, I don't know, libertarians. Well, same. Libertarians are going to complain. Well, well, same. You know, I know a lot of people that, that that's, you know, m money's tight and they don't, you know, like anything when you're asking for more money for more tax and things like that. Like you're basically asking people for a, a tax on the internet. Here's the motivation, Jade. Um, the motivation for the average person should be this. If they do not buy into some form of paying more for their music, music's going to atrophy. Live shows are not going to come back. But you're asking for a good Samaritan. You're asking for people to do the right thing just because it's the right thing. Yeah. People, people won't do that. Like we, we have a tough enough time just getting people up to a live show, period, to pay $10 where they'll pay $250 to see that one other artist, you know, that they only get to see every once in a while, you know, type idea, but they won't come to local shows. They won't support local artists. You know, it, it's, there's that problem. It's like almost having to change the mentality of the culture of music and the, the mentality of the, the culture, the going to shows, supporting, listening. If the only way to really stop people from using Spotify or even, you know, increase the payment on Spotify when every, they're, they're going to find a cheaper option somewhere else. So it's, it's kind of a weird process that we have to, to kind of look at as well, where we have to change the culture and the mentality. Like right now, I'm hoping, I'm really praying that this, this pandemic is going to cause a reset mm -hmm. in the mentality of, of shows, live shows, live music, live artists. And I'm, I'm really hoping it's going to, like, this drought is going to make people a little bit more thirsty to actually appreciate the live artists that are out there. And the promoters, actually, like, I'm, I'm a live performer, but I'm also a promoter, so I'm kind of going, crap, uh, you know, I can't, you know, book any bands. And, like, we've always focused on paying bands as much as we can, but if we don't get people to shows, we can't pay bands. And it's, we're, it, it's it's a vicious circle, <laughs> you know? It is. Yeah. I think that people will certainly sign it, like musicians will sign it, like Steve says. Yeah. And I bet that, like, lots of people would be willing to pay. I just wonder if you have, like, a plan to to address people who are asshats because... Well, I did last night. <laughs> Dusty, I actually did. I, I, had, I had some really interesting conversations with people who were who are musicians, who are creatives who don't want, there are creatives out there, unfortunately, who say, no, um, I, want, I want the royalty company, I want the royalties to go up, and I want my share because I'm getting X number of plays or streams. And uh, the person who's not getting any streams shouldn't get any of this benefit because they're just not good enough writers. They're shitty writers, so they shouldn't. Those people are clearly them. not a fan of Woody Guthrie. Exactly, right? So, <laughs> so. Hey, guys, I'm just going to interrupt gently. I got to go. Cause I got a two year old, I got to feed and put to bed. But um, Steve, have you, before I go, I just wanted to ask, have you talked to anyone at co-op co-op radio, Vancouver CFRO about this? Not yet. Uh, I, we're okay. just in the process of doing that. If you want to hook me up, if you can. Yeah, I'm on the board. So Jade, can you just connect us after? Will do. Um, your plan sounds like communism, my good sir. And that's what I like about it. Best of luck <laughs> good to idea. you. I am, I am a diehard socialist. Yes, I am. So. <laughs> that came through pretty clearly. All right, see you guys. Good luck. Thank you so much. It was great to meet you. Look forward to chatting with you. So, Harry, um, from the stance of, like, you know, from someone who's outside of Canada, what is your take on something? Has something like this been thought of uh, in Mexico? Has there been uh, a mere image? Has there been a... You know, how is it that like down in down in Mexico? Uh, well, <clears throat> everything the CV is, is, is talking about, about is uh, some kind of new for me. I mean, we have unions here. Also, we have uh, musicians that are not, um, how to say, uh, they are not mm, convinced about the amount they get having from the digital platforms. Um, and also, I mean, we have unions here, but it's not easy 
at all to get in, in, into them. Uh, so um, it's not easy at all to uh, foremost if you are a songwriter. You know, maybe if you are a mus uh, session musician, maybe you can make it easier. But now if you're a songwriter, as uh, my case, for example, uh, I like to 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 recording music, to to write my songs. I I am not really into being a cover band, for example. But if I want to make a record, if I want to, to touring, doesn't matter if it's in Mexico or outside Mexico, I have to have another kind of job to have a better income, to save money and to hit the road, you know? Because um, in my case, for example, my band doesn't play, let's say, a popular kind of music here in Mexico. And for that reason, the streaming, the streaming, the, um, the plays on the, uh, on the digital platforms are, are not good enough, you know? So if the digital platforms are paying so low and having like uh, 100, 200 listeners a month, can you imagine how much money can we get? It's very, very low. So we have to, to do another things. Also, as bands, for example, here in Mexico, it's very, very common to make hamburgers to send them and sell them, you know? Really? Not even with the merchandise. Not even with the merchandise. We, have, we are not chefs. We are not cooks. So we have to do another kind of things in order to, to have money and, uh, and, and, and continue to be in a, in a, in a um, let's say, original band, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's really hard here as well. With the, all the crisis uh, around the coronavirus, is very hard too, and um, and I hope, as Ari said, this uh, can be reset the desire to go to a show, to go to a a, um, a venue, to a small gig, but it also depends on the musician to take this as an opportunity. If if we go back to the normality, making uh, shows that are average they are not have uh, good production or not uh, good enough it is going to 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 happen the same thing as before the, vi the virus you know um just few assistance to the gigs uh i don't know that kind of stuff i guess so yeah uh, i'm sorry if i go out the, <laughs> the topic here no 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 that's you know, what is happening here is, is what is happening here in, in mexico it's not easy at all and um and yes, I'm, I, I think it's some, I have to say, it's incredibly great what you are doing. Uh, is, is it Steve or Stephen? I'm sorry. Steve. Steve. It's, yeah. it's really incredibly good what you are doing for the musicians community, and not only in Vancouver, but uh, the whole country in Canada, because as you said, uh, the music is one of the things that uh, people consume more from the artists, from the, from the arts in, in general. And they, I think the value is not, not enough, not enough at all. No. And, uh, and yes, well, that's all I have to say for now. I agree. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Thanks for your thoughts. Ari, do you have any more uh, thoughts, any questions? I, I have a bunch of questions for Steve. Um, hmm. they're, they're <laughs> I've been writing notes as, as you've been talking. Nice. Um, First of all, I just want to like really thank you for um, being an advocate for for all of us um, and uh, like, putting yourself out there and, and making like making this happen. Um, um, I come from many different sides of of the picture. You know, as a musician, I'm a composer, I'm a promoter, um, I'm a t also teach music. Um, so when it comes to like looking at some of this this support for musicians or what you call professional musicians what kind of criteria are you looking at like what kind of categories are you looking at in into that are you talking about music teachers promoters because like promoters still need to and really want to pay bands what they're worth um because you, we know venues aren't going to do that <laughs> um but what what kind of categories are you looking at so, so this? my my the way, I, the way I've been, I've asked this question quite a bit. And in fact, mm -hmm. uh, uh, my friend Doug Cox just emailed me just before this podcast, asked me the same question. And, uh, you know, Doug hosts the, the Vancouver Island Music Festival every summer. It's a huge festival. He's an amazing promoter. And, you know, he's feeling it too. So, so the, um, the, the criteria 
in my mind needs to be you need to qualify to to be a member of one of our music associations so in your case as a promoter you would probably need to be a member of the canadian live music association right as a promoter if you belong to that then you would qualify right you would be vetted as a professional right not somebody out on the you know in the shadows going oh wow you know thirty thousand dollars you know a year i'm going to cash in on that right uh it, it's not about that. And, and yes, it has the potential, just like any other structure, uh, to be abused. I mean, right now, there are people, sadly, who are trying to abuse the CER, CERB uh, benefit, right? And, and the government's trying to, you know, that. so they've, they've got a bunch of criteria set to make sure that, you know, if you're applying for, for the CERB or you're applying for the rent subsidy, that you have to qualify, you know, to, to apply. We would have to put similar kind of structures in place to make sure that we're vetting uh, the the artists. And it's not just musicians, it's the artists, right? And, or, or, or supports for the arts uh, in, in the ground. Uh, so promoters, of course, would, ha- would be part of that, that, uh, that group. But we all have our individual associations. For you, right. it would probably be the Canadian Live Music Association. As a creative, I would belong to SOCAN. Uh, as, a, as a performing musician, I belong to Music BC, right? So um, I've belonged to the Songwriters Association of Canada. I belong to Karis. I belong to a number of different associations. So, but if you were part, a member of one of those, that would vet you as being a professional. And then right. it would be no problem for you to, to, to access those funds. Right. The other part would be that you'd have to submit your income tax uh, return and uh, identify yourself in the entertainment business. So when I when I uh, submit, I not only submit as uh, a teacher uh, who's earning a teaching salary, but I also declare all my income as a gigging musician and as a creative. And I have my own proprietorship and I use that proprietorship to declare my income tax and my expenses. Right. So. Right. Um, I wouldn't, just as a disclaimer, I wouldn't qualify for any of this stuff, by the way. I don't benefit from this at all because my, as a, as a teacher, my income is way above the, the bracket that would qualify me to, to gain any of these benefits. Right. The only thing that I might benefit from as a, a, in my present situation is that I might not have to pay tax on any of my gig money anymore but I probably also wouldn't be able to claim any of my music expenses. So it'd probably be a wash, right? Yeah. Which is fine. No. I hate having to count those receipts at the end of the year anyways. But, <laughs> <laughs> right. but, 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 but just so you guys know, and I had to point this out to somebody who was throwing some pretty big stones at me last night on Facebook. Uh, I'm not doing this for, for, for myself. I'm doing this. My primary motivation is I teach students every year who are amazing musicians I've been teaching my rock school and recording arts program for 20 years. I've had the pleasure of watching my students go out and tour the world with their bands and, and become recording engineers and, and, uh, and uh, 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 radio promoters and, and, and all sorts of great careers in music. And it's all come to a crash. And I've got a bunch of students right now who are sitting at home right now crushed because their show that's supposed to happen next week is canceled, right? And that's- and, and, and they're not able to come to the classroom. And I worry that the kids that I'm teaching are not going to have the same benefit that I've had for the last 40 years when I stepped into Mr. Charles Russ's guitar class at Kitsilano High School. And he, he, he gave me the gift of music. And it turned into my career. And, and, and I, I love my job and I love my life as a result where in grade eight, I was a pretty lost kid, right? And, and that, that man saved me. Right? And music saved me. And I want the same for all my students moving forward. If we can't rebuild the music economy, my, my students are never going to enjoy what we've I, had. I, 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 I doubt that this will ever end. <laughs> you know, I think the, the joy of music will always find those who, who want it. I mean, you know, it's not like this is going to stop people from listening to music in general. Oh, I, I, live music I, is going to be limited. <laughs> yeah, live music will be limited. Live music will be limited and the quality of new music will be limited as well because mm-hmm. what I'm seeing is a real de- degradation because we don't have the recording budgets anymore. At the Juno Awards, both in Hamilton and in Vancouver, 
I, I went to the uh, to the um, uh, the Juno Awards uh, producers and engineers Q and A, and I listened to how much these guys have cut in their budgets, and they're now using samples for their kick drums, and they're using samples, you know, for they're using campers for their for for their guitar sounds, and and they're they're auto tuning like mad because they don't have time to develop a vocalist in in the recording session. And musicians are going out on the road without having developed their, their musicianship because we don't have that support anymore to develop artists properly. So the quality of music is degrading, not for everybody, because there's some really great creative stuff. I mean, look at what Billie Eilish did this year, right, in, in her parents' bedroom. Amazing. But she also had a professional mixer do, do the work on that, and it was professionally produced. And... You know, she had some industry help. It was a bedroom project, but it had a lot of support. Most people don't have those supports anymore. And, and unfortunately, the, the quality of music is starting to, to, to wane because we don't have an industry anymore that develops the artist. Yeah, we, we don't have the support to pay people to sit at home and practice. Their, you know, you're, you're practicing your guitar because you have another job that you want to get better at your guitar so you can start paying your bills with your music like that that's the end goal is nowadays versus back then you know it's like oh man you know if the band was good enough and you got the money up front you could sit at home and sit and write your tunes and then go hit the studio track it get it mixed and then put it out and you know we don't have the funding for that there is no more record companies that has the development side of it it's more just is the pre-packaged package done can we just give it a remix can we just shove it in the booth and then stick it out and is it a polished material like you know we don't have that the the, the you know the the subsidy to put towards developing thing and it sucks it it it, it changes music for sure and the general premise yeah. what the general premise of what i'm proposing is actually not unique uh today i read a couple of articles that we're talking about the need for for going back to where uh, um, artists are patrons of society, right? Um, which means that society funds the arts, right? It's not a capitalist venture anymore. It's a socialist venture because we recognize that the arts benefit us all and we all need to pay into it. So it's sort of a universal art subsidy that all citizens in, in our country uh, which is a very uh, social democratic uh, uh, concept. But once upon a time, that's how the arts were funded. Musicians didn't get paid directly. They were funded by patrons. Well, exactly. Right? Like, like look back to the classical composers. They weren't paid uh, by ticket sales. They were paid by the king to write a piece of music. Therefore, they composed it. They had the players play it. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, mm -hmm. the, 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 they, the royalty, the level of government paid for it because they knew it would make the people happy. Mm -hmm. uh, so in my proposal, I made the case, I made the, a very strong case in the last paragraph of the proposal that science has proven beyond the shadow of a doubt that music is an essential service to our society for, for mental health and, and general well-being. Um, that's indisputable. There's, there's just tons and tons and tons and tons of studies that show that. It's, it's essential for our cognitive development as well. Um, so given that it is such an essential service to our society, I think it, it is logical for our government to create a fund that is contributed to by every citizen in our, in our, in our country who has access to internet or data and is using music content and we all use it, whether we're walking, whether we're walking in the grocery store with our masks on and calming <laughs> ourselves, calming ourselves with the music that's playing over the over the the intercom, or we're listening to it in our cars, or we're we're, we're streaming it on our phones, or we're just listening to it in, in movies that we're watching, or any, we're we're consuming music, right? Um, we're watching a YouTube video. We're consuming music. I watched a whole bunch of them today on, on YouTube. I watched a whole bunch of concerts, concerts live streamed. I watched all sorts of music content. Uh, and people do it all the time. No one, if someone comes and says to you, I don't listen to music, I don't want to pay, I'm sorry, they're lying, okay? It's just not possible in our society, okay? So everybody is getting the product. Nobody is paying 
fair value for the product. And that inequity has to be remedied. And that's basically the, the core, the very core of this uh, uh, proposal. Sounds good. Anyone have any last, last uh, uh, points or questions for Steve? <clears throat> yes, oh, I, I have. have actually, I have. I don't know. You first. You first. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I, uh, I have a whole list of uh, questions, but I would probably rather email you and sure, uh, happy so to do that. I'm not taking up everybody's time with all of them, but <laughs> um, anyway, no, I, like, I, I guess talking about like, love for you to ask them, Ari, because it, it'd be great for people to hear the answers, right? So that, and that's, that's the point of this. Hopefully, you know, that's true. Ask that's true. So what, well, how about Harry start? Yeah, can Harry first? go first. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, well, this is actually a question for all of you. Uh, I'm trying to figure out why, what was the reason everything this has happened? I mean, what happened before to get until this point that having a low income, uh, all the things about money problems, what do you think was the reason that we, we have this issue here? There's an article. There's an article that I that, that I that I. If you look in the proposal, there's hyperlinks for certain okay. statements. The very first statement uh, states that uh, uh, musicians uh, musicians in, uh, can no longer earn a sustainable uh, uh, wage uh, income from from their music, right? And if you click on it, there's a great article. And I can't remember the guy's name. His first name's Frank. At, at any rate, he talks about the history of what happened. There's also actually a full report embedded in this proposal that has an economic evaluation of what happened in Vancouver for the last 40 years uh, in the music industry and how it declined in its revenue streams. Now, what happened uh, really is what I alluded to earlier. We used to have a musicians union that was functional and kept the bottom line from dropping under a certain point. There were standards and there were standards for musicians to play. There was also record companies that, that kept a standard for the remuneration of the artists and their bottom line as well. And what happened was in, in, in the late 70s, early 80s, when the punk scene came in, they kind of blew it all up because they didn't play by the rules, right? And venue owners started to realize that they can get bands for free or for beer or whatever, right? And that concept started to snowball. And eventually what happened was Venue owners realized that there was a, a huge supply of musicians and bands and a small supply of venues to play. So it was a buyer's market. They could lower the price to whatever. And you've got musicians going out there. You know, I'd go out and make uh, two, three hundred bucks as a solo artist. And I drive home and I I drive by a certain venue in New Westminster and I look in the window and there's eight guys on the stage. And I know that the budget in that room is 250 bucks. Right. And, and so they're all playing for like 25 bucks each. And, you know, that devalues our, 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 uh, the value of our, of our art. When the streaming thing happened, well, when Napster happened, that was the thing that blew it up as far as the recording side of it. When piracy started to happen, we couldn't stop it because it was in the Ethernet, right? Um, well, it, it devalued our, our economy because people were going, why should I go buy a record? I can share, I can peer to peer share with my buddy who's got the new Metallica album, right? And then Lars is going crazy and everybody criticized him for, for protesting, but he was right. You know, we need to protect our creative content. We didn't do it. So the, the digital age advanced way beyond our ability to control it. And as a result, we got exploited on all sides, right? As people realized they could pay less and less and less and less and less for the product that we were offering. And that's what happened, you know? It it's been a gradual degradation of the industry, actually. It's, it's been, been happening over years. <laughs> Thanks <Right>. to Napster. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's really um, been, a, you know, a bit of a sliding scale because with the, um, loss of the big record companies and having to be signed in order to put out a record versus the people that are able to make their own record in their basement that sounds just as good that can get commercial success and things like that um, 
means more content was able to be released because before you had to, you know, get in with a big record to be able to pay for the studio bills to be able to get a record out. And it costs a certain amount of money and a lot, a lot of amount of effort and things like that. And so there was, a, a, as Steve said, there was a standard that was, you know, when you heard a record and you picked it up in a CD store, it, you, you knew it would be good because it was professionally recorded. It, it would, you know, you could put it on your stereo and it would be whatever it was, but it would still like, oh, cool, that's a full record. Here, you know, with the whole everyone recording in their basement and being uh, access to put out music freely, it just allowed, you know, lesser and lesser quality of music and you know, last full albums, more singles, more three records kind of stuff. Oh, here's my newest single. Here's my next single. It's never like, oh, here's the full album kind of thing. Um, that has allowed uh, consumers to just be fed off that and to really want to, to to listen to that rather than spend the time and the effort to wait for the full record or to invest in an artist in that they really love about where they could just get drip fed song by song and be like, Oh man, that sounds awesome. It was done in someone's basement. Sounds great to me. I love it. Don't have to pay for it. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm talking about like technology helping us and being against us at the same time. We have, um, I, I don't want to mean any music, but there's specific people coming out and genres of music that are just pooping out like songs nonstop and it's auto tuned. It's no quality. It's, and I, I don't want to like, again, demean or uh, disrespect any other artists, but it's, it's just pop, pooping out there like nonstop. Whereas some of us that take care to like compose songs um, and really take um, pride in our production of our music, um, it costs us thousands of dollars to put out a freaking album. So it, the technology is helping us to sound better, but at the same time is also watering down the market as well by artists that, you know, but it's they, not they can't only, sing in a normal tune without auto tune. <laughs> Ari, it's not only, it's not only the independents who are watering it down. I referenced an article in my proposal that mm. talked about, uh, the homogenization of the industry because uh, because the budgets are smaller, because there's less revenue coming in from, from the recordings, budgets now are so small that, um, uh, or smaller, right, um, that uh, they're, they're looking for the cookie cutter um, uh, formula to get maximum amount of listeners for the shortest amount of time and then just keep cranking it out right yeah so, so the homogenization of music is 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 unbelievable some of the greatest uh not greatest but the top selling artists uh why does it all sound the same because there's only two writers that have been contributing to a lot of those songs in the world one's in sweden and the other one's in the states and <laughs> and, and seriously you can look up the writing credits the same two guys um and, and and the methods in which they're recording, as I found out when I went to these uh, uh, Q and A's at the Junos, um, they're using all the same sounds. They're using the same kick drum sample. They're using the same Kemper. Uh, that's 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 looking at at a very specific slice of of what's yes, of course, popular mm -hmm. music will sound like popular music because it has a very popular music format. You know, you can look at some of the greatest death metal albums that got released in the last ten years, and there's you know it's each band is eats their own writer and producer and things like that. And some of them have had huge critical success, uh, just not as much pop, you know, as much pop culture and all that. Same with funk and jazz and all that kind of stuff around the world. You can have these world renowned uh, jazz artists that come, um, you know, have a hard time just as much as any independent local artist uh, does just because of the sheer amount of uh, stuff that's out there nowadays. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it basically what it is right now is it's all formula, like it's all formula, and it's not all. There's lots of great bands out there that never get heard, you know, or rarely get heard, uh, who are still doing uh, really great creative work. Mm -hmm. But the stuff that's getting um, the airplay or the streams is the, the the corporate stuff that's pretty homogenous cookie cutter you know stuff um it's 
uh, it's they're, 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 they're producing earworms, right? It's, it's ear candy and, and it's infectious and they get the, the streams and then it's next and nothing's memorable. We're not going to see another Bohemian Rhapsody anytime soon. It's just not going to happen. You know? So Ari, did you have um, oh, just wait. Uh, another, another <laughs> uh, uh, question before we wrap up here? Um, I, I'd love to, to keep going on, but I, I want yep. to keep this under the hour. Yes, absolutely. Just one real quick one. Um, talking about um, like money and government allocation to this project and to this uh, coalition, um, a lot of the like the government justifies giving into the arts via grants, via all these other things. So they they look at it and go, okay, we're already giving money to this, but the process of getting a grant for an artist is is. Freaking really ridiculous! And you got to pay it's something really right hard, for. and you got to pay for yeah. something for you, right? So I'm wondering if, like, I don't, I'm sure you've already thought about this idea of, of like, okay, your government is already giving money to the art, so to speak, uh, via grants. But if they looked at kind of allocating a little bit more and directing that directly to reimbursing or um, or rebating artists. Um, directly, properly, instead of going through this big process and you know not knowing how to write it, so they don't hate it. Yeah, so their their art, you know. Yeah. So makes sense. Yeah, it does. So, so like I said earlier, um, uh, I don't know if I finished my thought, but the difference between what we're proposing and what has normally happened, right? Um, normally, what happens is. Uh, uh, our representatives go and lobby the government and say, look, we need more money. You need to take money out of the general tax revenue and give more to the arts or give more to public education or et cetera, or whatever, right? What we're doing is we're going to the government and saying, we want you to ask every consumer in Canada to pay $4 more to create a $2 billion fund so that you can then allocate that money where it's needed. Uh, uh, so the artists show need by the, through their income tax. If I'm not hitting $30,000 a year and I'm a legitimate artist, I get a top up so that I can pay my bills and be able to make another record or, or do my next tour. Uh, in addition, the grants will be there. I was thinking about that um, today. Um, and, uh, and really, I think the best way to do that is to, there's existing organizations already, like Creative and, and Factor and Canada Council. Um, who already do this job. We just need to give them more money so that there's more grants and perhaps make those grants a little easier to access because you're right. Right now the application process is ridiculous and it's ridiculous that we have to pay a grant writer in order to have a hope of getting that grant. Mm -hmm. Those need to be relaxed so that artists can get access to those grants a little, little easier, right? I mean, still legitimately, but not being what it is right now because it's, and this idea of having to come up with 50% of the money in order to get the grant is ridiculous too because that's just not going to happen anymore, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So I hope that answers the question. Absolutely, thank you. Perfect, it's been a pleasure and I'm sure we could keep going on. Uh, Harry, is there anything else you, you want to add before, before, before we end here? Um, well, first, uh, well, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm sorry I, I didn't say too much here, but I'm really sure I learned a, a lot of things. And, um, and nice to meet you guys. Nice to meet you too, Harry. Um, yeah. Um, if I can just plug the uh, coalition one last time. Absolutely, please do. If everyone who watches this, this uh, podcast, uh, and I want to thank Jay. Jay, thank you so much. You, this was a really great interview. Really, thank you. Uh, it was a really great roundtable. Um, it's the information I needed to get out there. You know, we needed to get out there to inform people and, and hopefully encourage them to come and join uh, this coalition, uh, which costs you nothing. Uh, we're not looking for anything. Uh, we're just trying to help. And uh, we're really hoping that everybody will go to www.canadianmusicianscoalition.ca. Uh, we're going to have a new website up tomorrow. Uh, we're going to take the grassroots one down and put up Robert's masterpiece and, and, and Ken's uh, wonderful graphics. Go to www.canadianmusicianscoalition.ca. 
And there's a link at the top. Actually, there's a couple of links. Uh, it says sign the petition. Click on that petition and sign it. It takes you like 30 seconds to do it or less. And uh, um, add your voice so that we can get you know, this thing happening, so that we can get a $2 billion support fund uh, that will benefit the entire music economy and get musicians back on the stages and back in the recording studios and help the venue owners open their doors again once this crisis is over and also help the kids uh, with music education. Thanks so much, you guys. Thanks for uh, doing this. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for all your hard work and for spearheading this. Thank you. Hey guys, it's Jade. Thanks for checking out the video. Uh, you can subscribe over here as well as check out some more of our cool videos. Um, and please, you know, uh, thanks for supporting us. That helps us support uh, local and independent musicians all over the world. Uh, this is really cool and I think you guys are awesome. See you guys later. Bye.